Lord, you brought everything into being by your powerful word. And you brought about a new creation in us through your word and spirit, breathing life into our dead souls. And now you have given us your most holy and precious word to instruct and to guide us. Now give us listening ears and hearts to obey, we pray. Amen. Amen. Please do be seated and do turn in uh, the Bibles on the um, tables to Matthew chapter 27. I'll be speaking from different parts of the Bible as we go through, but I'd like to read this section, given that it is Easter Sunday. So Matthew chapter um, 27, beginning to read at verse 57. Matthew 27, beginning to read at verse 57. We begin. As evening approached, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who had himself become a disciple of Jesus. Going to Pilate, he asked for Jesus' body, and Pilate ordered that it be given to him. Joseph took the body, wrapped it in, a, in clean linen cloth, and placed it in his own new tomb that he had cut out of the rock. He rolled a big stone in front of the entrance to the tomb and went away. Mary Magdalene and the other Mary were sitting there opposite the tomb. The next day, the one after preparation day, the chief priests and the Pharisees went to Pilate. Sir, they said, we remember that while he was still alive, that deceiver said, after three days I will rise again. So give the order for the tomb to be made secure until the third day. Otherwise, his disciples may come and steal the body and tell the people that he has been raised from the dead. This last deception will be worse than the first. Take a guard, Pilate answered. Go make the tomb as secure as you know how. So they went and made the tomb secure by putting a seal on the stone and posting the guard. Uh, Just imagine that you were hearing the gospel for the very first time. I find that difficult myself because um, I heard the gospel as a very, very young um, child, very familiar with it from a young age. But just try to imagine that you hear the gospel for the very first time. I want to tell you a true story about um, a tribe, a remote tribe in the jungles of East Africa. They knew nothing um, of the um, gospel, and they actually lived in constant fear uh, of demons and death. Then one day, a group of missionaries turned up, and they arrived with the Jesus film, which tells the story uh, of Jesus and his life, death, and resurrection, from the Gospel of Luke. The film has been translated into more languages than any other um, film in history. And the tribe, they'd actually never seen a film before, and they had never heard uh, of the name Jesus. Now here's what the missionary um, reports. Then all at once, on one unforgettable evening, they saw it all, the Gospel in their own language, language visible and real. The tribe watched this good man, Jesus Christ, heal the sick, bless children, teach multitudes, and perform miracles. They were enthralled. But when Jesus was seized and abused by Roman soldiers, they became outraged. They stood up and they shouted at the screen. When Jesus continued to suffer, they turned on the missionary operating the projector, maybe thinking he was responsible for the injustice. The missionary stopped the film and explained to them that the story wasn't over. So the people settled back down on the ground, holding in their emotions, and the film projector started um, where it left off. But then came the crucifixion. They watched in horror as Jesus was stripped and forced onto a cross. They cried out in agony with every hammer blow, pounding nails into his hands. The Lord's suffering was portrayed as intense, and then he died. And the crowd, the tribe, could not bear it any longer. 
They began weeping and wailing with such depths of grief that the film had to be stopped again. Once more, the missionary came out to calm the crowd down, promising that the story wasn't yet over. Then came the resurrection. They watched again as they saw the women come to the Lord's tomb, bewildered to find the stone rolled away and the grave empty. In a flash, two angels appeared saying, why do you seek the living among the dead? He's not here, he has risen. And then came the moment when Jesus himself appeared to his disciples, draped in white, saying, peace be with you. Pandemonium erupted. Such a joy swept over the tribe like a wind from heaven. Everyone was jumping, dancing, celebrating, because they knew that they just received the best news in the world. There was no calming them this time, because they'd finally heard about the one who had overcome death and so could banish their fear of death. See, the resurrection of Jesus Christ is extraordinary, isn't it? And it mustn't ever become ordinary or mundane to us as believers because it represents an epic struggle that deserves our full attention and also deserves our unending gratitude and worship. See, through Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, he overcame our greatest enemies of sin, Satan, and death. Jesus overcame these enemies personally, he overcame these enemies powerfully, and he overcame these enemies permanently. And that can never be mundane to us as believers. That is the great message of the gospel. That is what we're celebrating this evening. That is what Easter is all about. So for those of us who have heard the story of the resurrection all our lives, it may be that sometimes we um, forget just how joyous the message is or fail to appreciate just how wondrous this news is. What a life-changing, history-shaping event it was. So what I want to do briefly this um, evening is um, talk about the evidence uh, of the resurrection. That's from an historical point of view because it was an historical event. Just touching on them so you can go and look about them more. And also then following that with three points about how we experience um, the resurrection personally uh, as believers. So firstly, um, the evidence um, of the resurrection, of Jesus' resurrection Now, the things I'm going to say all surround Jesus' burial and resurrection, and they're all things that require um, explanation. This is what historians have to do, looking at any historical event. What are the circumstances surrounding the event, and how do they um, fit with other explanations? So let me give you some of the things that they need to think about. Number one, um, the soldiers. If you had witnessed Jesus' burial you would have seen that there was a a contingent of soldiers assigned to guard um, the Lord's um, tomb day and night. Now just think about that. In order to steal um, the body, to steal the corpse of Jesus, um, grave robbers would have had to this guard, we don't know exactly how many, but a number of people say that there are 16 because there are four watches that they do, who knows. But there certainly would have been some guards sleeping and then others who were awake and alert. So anybody wanting to steal the body would have had to step over sleeping soldiers and then confront soldiers who were wide awake, alert, and guarding. Now, why does that matter? It matters because the first hypothesis that was put forward to try and cast doubt on the resurrection was that his body was stolen. Now, the question to ask is, if his body was stolen, what happened to the soldiers? Okay, it's just one little thing that you have to answer a question for. Okay, here's number two, Um, the seal. The governor sent the soldiers to secure the tomb with an official seal to prevent anyone uh, from tampering with it. Now, this this seal consisted of cords that were tied um, across um, the um, the rock and then um, this clay seal that was put on so they'd know if anybody's tampered with it and then the official Roman governor's seal um, would have gone onto that clay and that piece of clay. Now, why is that important, the seal? 
Okay, it's not so much that the seal is important because think it all, it'd been difficult to get that off. <clears throat> it was just a seal. It wasn't difficult to get off. No, what it meant is that if you touched it, you would incur the wrath and might of the Roman Empire because you had tampered with something official of the Romans. Psychologically, if you were going to go to the tomb you, and roll the stone away, you had to be willing to face the might of the Roman fury for going there and tampering with the tomb. Who would do that? Number three, uh, the stone. If you'd witnessed the scene, you would have noticed that a big stone and was rolled to cover the front of the tomb. Who moved the stone? How could a frightened group of disciples or a dispirited group of women overcome the Roman soldiers long enough to subdue these Roman fighting men in order to then remove a huge stone in order to get Jesus' body out? Who moved the stone? It's a good question. In fact, a number of books have been written. Atheist journalists, atheist scientists, atheist um, detectives, atheist professors of history and other things. They've all set out for one reason or not, often that they married women who became Christians, and then they set out to disprove um, the resurrection. In fact, one man um, wrote a book. He called, he became, they, all of them became Christians. Looking at the evidence, they became Christians, and they wrote a book, Who Moved the Stone? The Bible has an answer. Angels. Angels moved um, the stone. Here's number um, five, uh, the sepulchre. Now, everybody agrees that the tomb was empty, the tomb itself. Even those who didn't believe that Jesus was raised from the dead didn't try to deny that the tomb was empty. It's agreed. Thousands of people, remember, were in Jerusalem for Passover. Hundreds of thousands. Extra-biblical sources, those outside the Bible, know um, that Jesus was a popular man. They record that that the crowds knew about him. He's one of the most famous people at the time. He's died, and he's been put in a tomb. He's been put in a tomb of a very prominent man, Joseph of Arimathea, a well-known man. A well-known man has died. He's been placed in the tomb of a very prominent, well-known man. And then this tomb is empty. And at the time, do you think that when the resurrection is proclaimed, these thousands of people who are hearing about it would just say, do you think anybody went down to the tomb? Lots of people went to the tomb. <laughs> would you have gone to the tomb? Of course you'd have gone to the tomb. <laughs> so what happened? Why is the tomb empty? Did the disciples steal the body? Did the disciples steal the body and then all of them die for proclaiming the resurrection that they know that they've invented? Highly unlikely, I suppose it's a possibility, but highly unlikely. Would the authorities steal the body? Well, which authorities? The Jewish authorities? The Roman authorities? Why would they steal the body? What purpose did it serve for them? Why is the tomb empty? Here's number five, the shroud. Could call it the grave clothes, but I'm going for S's as you can see. After Peter uh, and John heard the rumors of the resurrection, they ran to the tomb. And when John leaned over and looked uh, into the grave, this is in John chapter 20, he saw something that startled him so much that he didn't enter in. What did he see? He saw the grave clothes lying there like the empty chrysalis um, cocoon of a caterpillar. It's just there. Nobody inside it, just the empty grave clothes. You see, even the grave clothes on that first Easter Sunday cried out, he's not here, he's risen. Number six, um, the scars. Again, John 20, when Jesus first appeared to his um, disciples, and many of you will know Thomas was um, missing. Later, Thomas was invited by Jesus to touch the scars. Why does this matter? Why does it matter? Why do the scars matter? Because the scars of Jesus, still visible on his risen and glorified body, provided indisputable evidence to the disciples that this is 
Jesus of Nazareth, who died and is now risen and still bearing um, the scars. Uh, number seven, uh, the sightings. Uh, Acts 1, chapter 3. Uh, if you've been living, living in Israel in those um, days, you may have seen the risen Christ. It wasn't just the disciples. Um, Jesus appeared over um, 40 days to them. In fact, Paul uh, in 1 Corinthians um, talks about how at one point he, he appeared to more than 500 people at the same time, a huge um, crowd. That's the specific point that Luke makes in Acts chapter 1, verse 3. Here's what it says. After his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. He appeared to them. Many, many sightings of the resurrected um, Christ. Jesus overcame death uh, with life. But our knowledge of Jesus' resurrection it isn't merely an intellectual exercise as we seek to gather um, evidence. These are just some of the things to um, sure up our faith. No, because he lives, we can experience um, his resurrection life. Jesus overcame our enemies of sin, Satan, and death personally so that we can live a purposeful life. I spoke about Paul in 1 Corinthians. He does this inspiring, magnificent sermon about the resurrection uh, of Jesus Christ. And then he ends with these words. Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord, because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, what we do for the Lord, what we do in living for the Lord, anything we sacrifice for the Lord, any service that we render unto the Lord is not in vain. That is what gives us meaning and purpose to our lives here on earth. Without the resurrection of Jesus Christ, what we do in this life is ultimately futile. <laughs> If it really is all dust we are and to dust we return, then there is no meaning, there is no purpose. But Jesus' resurrection from the dead is a trumpet blast that says, no, there is meaning, there is purpose. Nothing done in his name is done in vain. Jesus overcame our enemies of sin, Satan, and death powerfully so that we can live a power-filled life. That's one of the core messages of the book of Ephesians as it reflects on the resurrection. Listen to these words from Ephesians 1. Paul writes, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people, and his incomparable great power for us who believe. That power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead. Did you get that? According to this passage, Paul says that the very power that brought Jesus Christ out of the grave to new life is available to all who trust in him. That power is available to transform our character so we can become more like Christ. It's available to answer our prayers as we pray according to the will of God, to strengthen and his people in their difficulties, that they might persevere and endure and overcome, to guide us through life as we seek to live for him, as we seek to serve him, relying on God's abundant grace in our lives. That resurrection power that brought Jesus out of the grave is available to every um, Christian. Jesus overcame our enemies of sin, Satan, and death permanently so that we can live an everlasting life. Because Jesus is risen from the dead, death is not final. The enemies of Jesus couldn't put the final seal on his tomb, and no one can put the final nail in our coffin. Jesus' resurrection, our Lord's resurrection, guarantees that all who put their trust in him will also be raised to new life. For he overcame the one who holds the power 
of death, the devil. And so freed us from fear of death. So we as Christian people can live in confident hope that this life is not all there is. In fact, this life is not even the best that there is. There is a glorious life beyond um, the grave. That response of that um, African tribe was wholly appropriate to such history-shaping and life-changing good news. Because through Jesus' life, um, death, burial, resurrection, he has overcome our greatest enemies. Jesus overcame these enemies so that we can live a purposeful life, so that we can live a powerful life through his spirit, so that we can live everlasting life, knowing that the grave is not our final destination. This is the great message of the gospel, and this is what we remember and celebrate this Easter time and what we're going to sing and worship God about now in our remaining songs.